by another fellow named Zimmerman. And he says this, in his monumental work, Family and Civilization, Zimmerman explained, the trustee family is so named because it's more or less considers itself as immortal, existing in perpetuity and never being extinguished. As a result, the living members are not the family, but merely trustees of its blood, rights, property, name, and position for their lifetime. The trustee family envisions the family primarily in religious terms. It's not the nuclear family as we think of it, or even the extended family, but all the members of the family in the past and the future, as well as in the present age. And a sacred bond that uh, unites members in the present generation with ancestors who gave them life, and the same bond unites them with their future descendants who will perpetuate the family name, honor, and worship. And this is hardly what most folks today mean when they speak of the family. And this concept of family is uh, the concept that Israel had. It, it really wasn't about the nuclear family. It, it had to do, uh, it goes all the way back to the tribes of Israel, right? The 12 tribes of Israel. And uh, so they see their eternity as being a family, being a part of a family in the Israel culture and religion. Now let's jump back then to our story in chapter 4. Uh, Boaz has told Ruth that he'll marry her, and she need not worry about anything. But in the story, in this chapter, it is painfully and explicitly detailing the legality behind the transaction, right? The transaction must be above board. It must be lawful to the letter of the law. Um, we gave uh, each of our sons, as they were growing up, at some point, a car. And we gave them the car, each of them. Now, they, they would argue about how nice it was. or it, You know, they weren't that nice. But we were just trying to help them out because we loved them. And uh, because we loved them, we gave them a vehicle, uh, which each of them drove. Andrew's still driving his. <laughs> but what we had to do to make it legal was go to DMV. Right? Is that what it's called? Um, Bureau of Motor Vehicles, BMV. And we had to uh, transfer the paperwork, and we had to pay the fees. There were no taxes because it was a gift, but we had to pay, right? And you have to transfer the plates, and then they have to pay for plates and tags, and you have to do it legally. And so what Boaz is doing is much the same here. He loved Ruth and Naomi, and he desired to help them. He pledged to them. But he had to accommodate the law to make the arrangement valid and lawful. Folks, I want to remind you of the title of the sermon that I gave Jason. Love is the answer. Love is the driving motivator behind all that's happening. But uh, the law has to be accommodated at every point. This act that Boaz does by going to the city gate foreshadows it foreshadows what Jesus did for us according to a third century rabbi in the law of Moses there was 365 laws prohibitions and uh, for our sake today we can just imagine the Ten Commandments because they were a part of those 365 but we don't really need to think about much more than that Throughout the Old Testament, God often spoke of his love for us, and he promised us redemption, right? And so we have a scripture here in Isaiah 51, verse 11. It says, those who have been ransomed by the Lord will return. They will enter Jerusalem singing, crowned with everlasting joy. Sorrow and mourning will disappear, and they will be filled with joy and gladness. And the scripture is filled with these kinds of passages, these kinds of promises from God. Because why? God loves us. He's always loved us. So he's loved us and he's promised us redemption through and through the scripture. But in order for him to do that, the law has to be appeased. We have to accommodate the law. 
And there was a price and fines and fees and these kinds of things that had to be paid for before the purchase of any soul would be counted as valid and lawful because there were witnesses in the heavenly realm watching what God was doing. God had to make this above board and uh, to the letter and most importantly because God himself is holy and righteous and he knows every ounce of value that goes into saving a soul but he has to accommodate the law so why in Romans seven twelve, Paul writes this the law is holy and the commandment is holy and it's righteous and good now the law is folks actually a reflection of God's holiness of his righteousness so God loves us and he wants to save us but he has to make it right with himself isn't that something no one could offer well let me say this the price of this redemption uh, was of the highest order right uh, it wasn't money it wasn't gold it, it was blood and, and it wasn't just any blood for our souls to be purchased it had to be holy blood blood without blemish theoretically it could have been the blood of any human being as long as they were holy but Abra Abraham did not fit that description Isaac nor Jacob fit that description Elijah did not have holy blood David certainly did not John the Baptist Jesus called the greatest man who ever lived he didn't have blood that was good enough valuable enough to pay the price it wasn't pure enough and you know I don't have that kind of blood that I could pay for your soul and neither do you have that that you could pay for mine no one could offer the price the precious blood even if they wanted to God understood this as he looks down upon us and he's even amongst us in the temple and through the wilderness and so on and so forth he loves us um, when I was in college my brother and I were roommates and we had rented an apartment and we had to uh, paint the apartment first you know so we got I was really ambitious a lot more ambitious as a younger man and I was painting you know I had more than half of it done and he came in and uh, did he pick up a paintbrush and help me no what he started doing was telling me how I could do better you know criticizing and uh, I let it go for a while but you know he went and got some tea and came back and talked a little bit more about it I was doing the trim up by the ceiling and it was a little squiggly I didn't tape it off you know and uh, finally I said look Frank if you can do it better just do it you know and so he took the brush dipped it in the paint got on the little ladder nice and smooth made a beautiful perfect line he stopped looked at me and goes that's how you do it and he left <laughs> <laughs> that's how you do it God said as he looked upon us I'm gonna have to do it I'm gonna have to do it God then was born a man his Holy Spirit was placed inside of that man Jesus his spirit and he lived a life without ever sinning without ever doing anything that was against his law or any law for that matter without ever having an inappropriate thought God lived Peter in first Peter 2 22 it says he committed no sin no deceit was found in his mouth and in Galatians 1 3 
It's beautiful. It says, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You see, God came and he paid the price. He's the only one that had holy blood. So let's uh, read a little bit more in Ruth chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. I want you to consider how love is the answer. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And then he went to her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The woman said to the women in the neighborhood, said to Naomi, Praise be the Lord, who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age, for your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child, laid him on her lap, and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse and the father of David. Right? Do you know who then was born in that line of family? Jesus. Jesus was born. Love is the answer. Think about uh, how Ruth loved Naomi, and she clung to her. And she came to her land to worship her God and live by her land's rules. And she learned the rules, the laws, and she lived by the land, and she worked hard. And she got to know Boaz, and, and Boaz began to love her. And then Naomi uh, said, you need to go and basically propose to your kinsman redeemer. And she obeyed, and, and she went, and she loved Boaz. And he was an old man, and he even says so. He goes, you know, you're a little bit crazy. You can have any guy you want, you know, but why, why do this? He goes, but I know you're of good character. I know your motives are good, and I know you're doing it out of proper love. And he goes, tell you what, I don't want you to worry about this at all. I'm going to take care of everything. Don't fear I'm going to take care of. And so Naomi was acting in good faith with her daughter-in-law, trying to lead her to the proper place. Ruth obeyed the word of God all along the way. Uh, Boaz obeyed the word of God and became the kinsman uh, redeemer. And this is all motivated by love. In many ways, the story of their lives, though, even though we're in chapter 4 and wrapping up today, is really just beginning, right? I mean, they just went through all of the first process, getting to know each other, going through the engagement phase, sort of, going uh, through the law. They got the marriage license, and then they, they're going to go and actually get married. And if you think that on the wedding day, that that's where love ends, and that's the climax, how many of you can witness that that's really where it all begins? Right? That's where it really all begins. Yes, the love of Ruth for the God of the Israelites and the faith she had in his word caused her to go work in the fields and glean. Yes, the love of Ruth out of obedience to Naomi caused her to approach Boaz. Yes, the love of Boaz is, is highlighted as he responds favorably to them uh, according to God's word. Yes, the love of Boaz for Ruth Naomi and Elimelech, his relatives, and for the tradition of his people, caused him to go to the city gate and legally finalize the deal. But in many ways, out of all four of these chapters, their story really begins right here. Folks, love is the answer, but you haven't really thought it through. You haven't seen the movie play forward through to the end yet. The movie's really just beginning. They get married, they have a son, and this son is so precious because he keeps the name of Elimelech going, and Naomi is thrilled about that. She's a part of that family. But that little baby is an ancestor to Jesus Christ. Through all of that that we read, uh, the outcome of it is an ancestor to Jesus Christ. 
So as you can imagine, it's, it's by love for each other and for the God of Israel uh, that this came about. Their, only, their story begins here, but in many ways, our story begins there too. In the same way, our relationship with God is really only beginning when we come to know Christ as our Lord and Savior, and He redeems us. And it's as if at that moment that we're married to Him. It's a new, it's a new thing. It's a new relationship. And then we must live together and do life together. And the key to that relationship is love. Love for God, love for each other. That's the key. Have you ever heard anyone say something like this? Oh, we can never quit sinning. We're just sinners saved by grace. And I know that we were sinners saved by grace, but they do it in the present tense. And what they mean is they're still sinning, but it's okay because they have the grace of God. We're just sinners saved by grace, meaning that we remain living in our sin as if we were never redeemed. This would be a lot like Ruth saying somewhere here in the story toward the end, oh, I'm, I'm a pagan Moabite, and that's all I'll ever be because that's all I ever was. It's just not the truth. It's not true that you, you remain living in your sin or that God wants you to remain living in your sin. In fact, it's quite the opposite. The scripture is completely the opposite. It's not God's will for your life. And uh, so I, I bring up this scripture again to just simply point out how counterintuitive the other thought is. I know that I've brought it up a lot, um, but it has to do with being bought with a price. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, Paul writes, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. And so I want to ask you this question. Would you like to know how you can live a life that honors God in every way? If I can give you a very simple way to do it. I have only two unwritten rules. As soon as Stacy moves the slide. Two unwritten rules. Okay, so that's supposed to be a joke. Get it? I have two unwritten rules. Okay. Truth is, um, I can point you to one <laughs> really easy rule. Okay, you want one for, in, you know, in all seriousness? Here it is. In Romans 13, 10, Paul writes this. Love does no wrong to others, so fulfills the requirements of God's law right? When you love God and you love others, you actually live a perfect life, a holy life, when you love with godly love. So I want you to think of it this way. Think of the commandments, the law, the Ten Commandments. If you had godly love and you love God, you would not have any other gods before him, right? Because uh, you would just truly love him uh, to death, so to speak. You wouldn't have any idols in your life because you just adore Jesus and you're so thankful for his Holy Spirit living within you. You certainly wouldn't take his name in vain. Use it carelessly. A lot of people think that it's just swearing with his name, but really it's using God's name carelessly. You would remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Keep it separated apart for God. You would just do that because you love God. You see, um, it's the Holy Spirit living in you that convicts your heart to do these things and enables you to do these things, right? Uh, only Christians could do this. Non-Christians can't do this because they don't have the Holy Spirit. They don't have the ability or the capacity uh, to even love in a godly way. You wouldn't kill anyone because, obviously, you love people. But Jesus says, if you are angry with your brother, you have murdered them. 
you have slayed them. So we keep that in mind. Jesus is not just worried about what we're doing anymore like the Old Testament. Now he's worried about what we're thinking and what we're feeling. But with the help of the Holy Spirit and the true love of God in us, if we remember that as we receive God's mercy, we are to give mercy. As we receive God's love, we are to give love. Then we truly wouldn't kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. And Jesus again tells us, well, it's not just running off with a married man or woman. It's thinking about it. Right? So he takes it to a whole new level, which is completely impossible unless your heart is filled with the living God. And so you go to God and you pray for help. And he helps you just to not do that. He delivers you from that. And so it is all the way through. Uh, if you covet, what does that mean? Does anyone know what coveting means? It means wanting something else that someone else has that's not yours. And in a way, when you desire something like that, you're kind of breaking all the covenants, Paul says. I mean, you're stealing from them. You're kind of killing them. You know, you're kind of lying to them. You know, you're acting all nice and everything, but you're jealous because they got a nicer yard than yours. You know, you still got dandelions. They, they don't. You know, they got a riding mower you're pushing. You know what I mean? Uh, so coveting. But you wouldn't really covet. You wouldn't want other people's things. You would be satisfied because you had Almighty God living in your heart. And you would be thankful and counting your blessings each and every day, your own blessings, the way God has graced you in life. It would be so exciting and so peaceful. So the book of Ruth, folks, is really a love story. And we have seen what godly love looks like from every angle in this story. It, it shows God's love for us by his providential hand over our lives and through his word. It shows what our love for God should look like in real time as people live out the word of God righteously. It shows how we are to have love for each other in a self-sacrificing way. And it teaches us that while Christ fulfilled the law by purchasing us with his blood, brings us into reconciliation with himself, he wants us to, and it enables us to also fulfill the law by simply um, doing our best to have and share the love of God. If you have and share the love of God, you'll be a perfect person in God's eyes. So, in the same way, then, godly love needs to define and depict our lives. It needs to define us, and it needs to describe us. When people would describe a day in the life and times of Henrik or Cade, I'm almost done, man. You can make it. When they would, when they would describe it and define it, it would be a godly description, just like this story. It'd be a story that they can put in the Bible if there wasn't enough of them already. Does that make sense? All right. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, I want to thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, Lord, for um, being redeemed, for redemption. I thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross and shedding your blood for us, for uh, fulfilling all the criteria of the law, Lord, for taking care of that and indeed setting us free. I thank you, Lord, for your love, for filling our hearts with your very self. I thank you, God, for loving us and sharing with us and giving us the capacity to think like you, to feel like you, and to act like you. Lord, in whatever ways we don't, we just surrender to you now. We just lift it up to you, God, and just ask you to heal us and deliver us and forgive us and to save us from anything that is unpleasing to you. We do thank you, Lord, and we love you, Jesus. We pray all of this in your name. Amen. This morning, as we 
uh, wrap things up here. We're going to share in communion. And uh, I want you to be thinking and praying to the Lord this. Help us to love you, God, and each other in a righteous way, according to your word. Will you pray that this morning before you come? Will you surrender all that you are before you place yourself in the presence of Almighty God? Which is what is happening when we uh, partake in communion. The Bible describes it as being present with Jesus himself. And so while we obedient do the, obediently do this as human beings, we're walking up the center aisle and we're taking a piece of this bread and a cup of juice. God is miraculously working uh, in the heavenly realms and in our, whole, in our spirit, with his spirit. He's transforming us. As we get ready to enter into the presence of God, ask him to fill us with his love and to have the capacity to share it so that we can live perfectly before him. Today, as we share in communion together, I'm just going to ask you uh, to come up and, and uh, take the communion uh, off of the communion table. And we have the little pieces of bread on, my, on your left and the juice, but on the right are a few cups that have the gluten-free wafer. If you need the gluten-free wafer, go ahead and take one of the cups and uh, partake that way. Listen, folks, don't underestimate the power of taking a moment and just kneeling before the Lord. I want to encourage you to kneel at the altar and uh, just thank Him, just praise Him, just spend a moment with Him. If you cannot kneel down, I know some of you have replaced knees or whatever, uh, feel free to sit on the front pews and share a moment before the cross and uh, share in communion with your Lord and Savior. So as soon as I take the uh, lids off, I want you to feel free to make your way up the center aisle and share in communion this morning.
Father God, we thank you for today, and we thank you uh, so much so that love is the answer, that no matter the problem, if we, if we turn to you and we turn to your love and your grace, that, that the answer is there. Uh, and so, Father, we thank, you for, uh, we thank you for Pastor Chris's corny jokes, even. I know we're supposed to be grateful in everything, so uh, I'll be grateful in the, even in that, Amen. and even when they're at my expense. Amen. Thank you that they weren't today. <laughs> Uh, but Father, uh, we do thank you for a pastor that shepherds us, that, uh, that loves us and is good to us, and uh, we praise you for that. And as we go our separate ways today, I ask that you place your hedge of protection around each and every one of us, guard it with your angels, and let nothing through that doesn't belong. And we, uh, we, we praise you that you're going to bring us all back together again real soon, and uh, we thank you for that, and we thank you for today. We thank you for a wonderful service, and we thank you for being part of it and sending your Holy Spirit to dwell in us. We praise you. We give you all the, all the honor, all the glory, all the praise. It's all yours forever and ever. And we pray these things in Jesus' good name. Amen. Amen. All right. You guys are dismissed. Everybody have a great week.